Hello, everyone, and welcome to Exploring the Origins of the Wuhan Coronavirus. This is our live panel at the Epoch Times looking at this hit film that we've just put out that's garnered over 70 million views uh, across uh, YouTube, Facebook, and a variety of other channels, uh, tracking down the origin of Wuhan coronavirus. We're here today with a panel of experts. We've got Dr. Sean Lin. He's one of the experts in the documentary, former lab director for viral diseases branch at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. We've got Dr. Joe Wong. Dr. Joe Wong is the president of NTD Canada. Back in the day, he spearheaded SARS vaccine development at one of the largest vaccine companies in the world. And of course, we've also got Joshua Phillip, who is, of course, the star investigative reporter who started this whole thing, who started digging. Um, and myself, I'm uh, Jan Jekielek, the host of American Thought Leaders and senior editor at the Epic Times. Dr. Wong, what are the actual possibilities around this origin? Uh, to your question, I, I think um, there are five possibilities. Um, Number one, uh, the virus uh, might have occurred naturally. Um, the uh, developing an animal host and, and then jumped to humans in um, somewhere uh, around November last year. And the second scenario um, is that the jump actually happened uh, earlier than uh, November last year from, human, from animal to human and uh, the virus uh, involved within human body for uh, a period of time gained something we call the gain of function so that the virus can um, uh, jump from hum human to human, human to human uh, transport. Uh, so this, this, this um, function was gained within the human body uh, of uh, the virus in um, evolution. So that's the scenario number two. Number three, um, there are a lot of uh, biological labs and with virus in uh, their uh, uh, storage and uh, the culture of, of different viruses uh, exists in all over the world in, in lab setting and uh, maybe some, some uh, culture uh, escaped uh, and, and, and started infecting people. This scenario number three. Uh, scenario number four is that we know that uh, uh, scientists around the world are trying to develop vaccines against different uh, pathogens, uh, for instance, HIV or SARS or other things, and they use virus as, uh, as a um, vector. So this kind of construct may have escaped uh, from the lab setting and started to infect people. So. The, this scenario number four would be, um, um, you know, it's a it's a byproduct of uh, of genetic engineering, but it's it, the purpose was benign. Um, the last scenario uh, is bioweapon development. Of course, this is regarded as uh, a, trans uh, a conspiracy theories. So it uh, it probably uh, um, for another uh, discussion, but. Uh, uh, this guy, uh, they, this virus we know didn't just fall from the sky, it, it, it came from somewhere. And uh, with uh, more than 150 people killed by this virus, it's really uh, tragic, human tragic that the human being, human race have never seen before. It, it, depend, it demands the scientific community to look at all possibilities. I'm going to take a question from our audiences here, and this is going to, I think, to go to uh, Dr. Lin. The question is from Hale State McQueen. Is it true that SARS-CoV-2 contains sequences of HIV and Ebola? If so, why aren't we hearing more about that? Seems like the odds of that happening naturally are next to nothing. Would certainly mean that it was engineered. Oh, uh, Dr. Lin. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Yong, for uh, inviting me to this yeah. panel. So I think a quick <laughs> summary is that uh, I think the, the origin of the virus it is still uh, mysterious. It was working during the pre-call. 
it's really, really a, a mysterious, one of the big mysterious uh, story right now. <laughs> Um, so I did see a report mentioned about uh, people being seen TB120, uh, one of the glycoproteins sequence in, uh, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2's uh, S proteins, but I haven't seen a report talking about Ebola sequence in, uh, in a SARS-CoV-2 sequence. But overall, I think right now, very little evidence to prove that, because uh, most of these uh, studies uh, try to compare in different virus sequence uh, Sometimes you, you're using a big blast and you identify a, a sequence, maybe uh, showing homology to um, HIV's uh, GP120, the envelope protein. And some people said uh, part of the GP120, the GP41 is also there. But however, uh, I think uh, through this kind of blast and alignment, sometimes you've got a lot of viral protein sequence can align together. And it depends on the homology uh, percentage. And so, it's hard to be a solid evidence say, all right, you, you got this uh, other virus insert into the SARS-CoV-2. So this part, I think, still, um, it's hard to be a solid evidence. Uh, and meanwhile, I want to mention a couple of uh, reports. Technical staff talking. Yeah, I want to mention a couple of reports mention, mentioning uh, the study about the animal origin of the virus. Mm -hmm. So one uh, report is on uh, nature medicine. They, they study about, uh, the title is Proxim Proximal Origin of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is uh, done by a uh, research group in the Script Institute, led by Christian uh, Anderson. So in this paper, she highlighted the uh, uh, receptor binding domain in uh, spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. And he mentioned uh, the, uh, there are five important amino acids actually uh, showing opt optimal binding uh, to the, the receptor, uh, ACE2 receptor. However, they argue that uh, this binding affinity is not an ideal one uh, as predicted by the computer model. So they're thinking that if, you know, uh, the rationale basically is that if it, it is a lab engineer, there should be an ideal uh, binding, not a, just an optimized binding. So this is one argument, but I think this argument ha has some flaws in their rationale because uh, uh, the receptor and spike protein binding just an initial step, and there are many factors that influence the virus fusion and entry. And also, uh, they mentioned about uh, if it's a lab engineered virus, and then it should use some of the uh, current uh, reverse engineering systems. And they cited the reference actually was in 2014. Uh, but when I look at those review articles, they mentioned about three reverse engineering systems. Um, but I, when I check uh, Dr. Shi Zhen Li at the Wuhan Institute of Virology's uh, lab, uh, checking on her previous publication, I actually saw even just on 2016, she had actually upgraded part of her uh, reverse engineering system too. Uh, from, for example, on the in vitro ligation system, she upgrade from six segment to eight segments uh, system. So basically, uh, as long as the lab is working on this um, gain of function study or on the reverse genetic studies on coronavirus, the system can always evolve. So I think uh, that rationale from the uh, uh, Script Institute's paper is still uh, uh, flawed. And and also, I want to mention the key issue here, you know, most people thinking about lab engineer virus, it primarily thinking, all right, I'm kind of like doing uh, different like uh, matching right, process. I can put different pieces together. But actually, uh, one of the biggest lab engineer process is called uh, animal selection or M plus in vitro selection. So for example, if you put the a virus, maybe it's a natural generated virus. If you put into an animal model and do serial passages, at each round of passage, I select an even higher pathogenicity for the virus. Then I can get a, a very strong pathogenic uh, virus after, for example, a dozen rounds or even 20 rounds of passage. And even as early as 2007, similar kind of gain of function study was already established. Uh, for uh, coronavirus. So, so for this kind of gain of function study in an animal model, it's very hard to track uh, whether it's, you know, from different segments to see whether it's lab engineer because it can use a, a, a wild type virus, but up to through intentional passaging, it's also manipulated. 
So in this way, it's very hard to track these you know, from the end product to see whether it is engineered. Because when the virus replicates quickly in the animal host, its sequence can be uh, mutated quickly and also get selected intentionally, humanly selected for higher pathogenic ones. So that's why I think this is also a biggest uh, flaw in that paper's rationale. You cannot exclude this possibility. And so simply based on uh, gene sequence uh, alignment and homology analysis is not enough to prove whether a product is lab produced or not. Oh, so that's, very, that's very fascinating, actually. And uh, I, I can't help but think, you know, you, you mentioned uh, virologist Shi Zheng Li, Dr. Shi Zheng Li, which is actually <laughs> featured uh, in this documentary uh, prominently. And, I, and we have a question from one of our audience, and I'll actually give this to Josh. Um, Weibin88 asks, the best question is, where is virologist Shi Zheng Li, the bat woman of China? Yeah, so this bat woman of China, China, this doctor, she was one of the world-renowned, world-famous bat coronavirus researchers. And during the time when you would expect the Chinese Communist Party to put her front and center is the number one propaganda, you know, figure of representing the Chinese Communist Party's advanced research coming to save the world and doing all this mass diplomacy and trying to promote themselves as having the China model, this totalitarian communist system as being the most effective in combating the virus, which is what the narrative is spreading is, you would think they would take her out and show her around and say, look at the research she's been doing, it's going to save all of us. And she is dead quiet. That laboratory in China is dead quiet, despite the fact that they were researching viruses just like this. At all possible times, this is the, in any normal circumstance, would be the time that the Chinese Communist Party would use this front and center in all of their propaganda, and we're hearing nothing from them. And so for me, this is something, say, an indicator, something to look at that does suggest something weird is going on when it comes to that laboratory. Why are they keeping it quiet? Why are they all quiet? You know, that's actually in incredibly interesting and speaks to another question. Uh, our audiences are very, very um, uh, kind of in tune with, with what we've done here, I think. Um, so recently there have been these reports, and I think I'll, I'll uh, pass this section on to Dr. W this question on to Dr. Wong. Um, recently there have been media reports about the State Department cables. I think this was uh, Josh Rogan in the Washington Post talking about you know safety concerns at precisely this lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, do you share these concerns? Um, what where are we at here? Well, I would l love to see evidence showing that there is no lab origin of this uh, novel coronavirus. I actually wrote to Dr. Anderson uh, um, at the Scripps Institute in, in uh, California, um, basically asking for evidence that uh, his conclusion that uh, this, this virus didn't come from a lab. Um, because his paper didn't give us the evidence. So um, I don't want to, uh, to hear that this actually, somebody actually made this, uh, that caused so many people die from it, but uh, we cannot afford not asking this question if the evidence uh, doesn't show uh, it. So basically, um, the, the, the State Department uh, diplomatic cable, um, they, they're based on um, information that we in the public don't really have. But what we have is that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the vir virologists in that in Wuhan Institute, uh, Dr. Shi Zhen Li and uh, her colleagues, have been man manipulating Vir uh, coronaviruses. That's the fact that we know, and they have published uh, extensively on their research. This is fact number one. Fact number two is that uh, we knew that Chinese labs have leaked. So some uh, virus have escaped from the lab setting. For instance, in 2004, um, uh, SARS uh, virus have escaped uh, labs in Beijing, that's very well documented. So 
putting those two together with um, some information maybe the, uh, the diplomatic people have access that we don't have, it's very uh, reasonable to ask the question. So can we look at the lab? Why not, uh, this is like a red line from the scientific community um, that we uh, somehow it's not politically correct or it's, it's, a, it's a red zone that we cannot go in. Um, but, you know, we just have to ask this question. You know, uh, I'm just thinking, I'm gonna uh, volley a question over to Josh right now. Um, something that's really important, and I've seen this conflated a lot in a lot of uh, journal, uh, journalistic pieces and so forth, the idea of lab origin and the idea of engineered. People kind of use them interchangeably, but I know we don't see it that way. I wonder if you could break that down for us, Josh. Yeah, no, we, we don't, don't see it that way, way at all. Honestly, Honestly in, in my personal, personal analysis, based, based on the research, research from this documentary, I do not think this is a man-made virus. virus. Just, Just because, because I think it is not a man-made virus, virus, that doesn't mean I'm not going to show other other evidence suggesting otherwise. otherwise. The, the fact, fact is that they were making they were making chimeric viruses there. They were doing experiments with Dr. which Dr. Shanlin noted at that laboratory. Uh, they, they did, did have, have these programs. programs. I'm not going to write, write that off just, just because I don't, don't agree that that may be the origin of it. At, At the, the same, same time, time, yes, just, just because, because it came from, you know, just, just saying it came from a lab does not mean that it's man-made. These, these, these two should not be conflated. And, and frankly, I think it's uh, disingenuous that a lot of journalists are trying to conflate the two to discredit the idea that it may have come from this laboratory at a time when the world needs answers. And frankly, when in any normal circumstance, as uh, Dr. Wong noted, uh, this, this should be, you know, the main place we started looking. This should be the first place we started looking. And allegedly in China, this was the first place the Chinese Communist Party started looking when news came out of a virus escaping. So, so why is the rest of the world seemingly quiet on that possibility? Why is this not being taken seriously? But I guess given, you know, saying that now, it does seem to be the case that after we publish this documentary, at least, uh, other articles came out suggesting that it may have come from this laboratory. It is now a, being seen as a real possibility. But again, yes, coming from that lab does not mean it was necessarily man-made, because as uh, Dr. Lee, or sorry, Dr. Xi's uh, papers in the past noted, which were public, she was traveling all around the world and collecting bat coronaviruses from every corner of the world. And so that laboratory had these viruses there. Uh, Dr. Lin, do you think yeah. uh, this whole wet market story based on the progression of events that Josh uncovered and uh, related uh, whatever scientific information is available, is it some kind of cover story as, as a, lot, a number of people, increasing number of people now are suggesting? Yeah, I think the wet market stories, uh, initially the uh, Chinese government heavily emphasized about their potential. Um, but I think based on the science report first, uh, there's a report mentioning at least uh, 14 out of 41 cases of the early cases in December and early January, and they were not related to the Huanan Sif market. So there's, and also um, now tracking back to earlier cases in November and early December, those patients had nothing to do with Huanan Sif market. So basically that means uh, these stories are probably just a smoke. Um, then I think this question deal with the basic issue about what is the animal reservoir uh, or intermediate animal host for this virus. Because most people think that this is, uh, outbreak come from a zoonotic exchange from one animal or, sec or two different animals to uh, humans, right? So this is the biggest question. And so these also have two aspects. One is why the Chinese government, uh, local, especially local uh, Wuhan CDC, they did not collect the animal samples in Wuhan area, not just in the Huanan seafood market, because even if you mistakenly close down the Huanan seafood, seafood market, but there are other seafood markets in Wuhan too, and why don't you collect animal samples and give a, you know, rounds of testing to ident identify which animal might have the virus. And actually recently I saw a report from Dr. Shijinli's group they published uh, uh, in late March, mentioning they identified uh, SARS-CoV-2 in domestic cats, right? And what's more bizarre is that they designed this experiment in January. And so they started collecting the cat samples in January. 
but you didn't see any alarm sent to the public. So for, as a scientist, you know the risk that the coronavirus may infect some domestic cats and rodents as well. Why don't you quickly collect those samples in January and do a quick testing and tell the public? And instead, you design a study, it takes two, three months to publish, and then you didn't give any warning for the public, right? Because many public, many individuals in Wuhan may be carrying these cats as pets, right? Will they be infected by uh, you know, sick cats, right? So it's a risk there. The scientists didn't do that. So this is one big issue about, <laughs> about this animal reservoir. And then also regarding about animal, uh, potential animal uh, intermediate host, right? So there are report mentioned about pangolin, uh, pet, uh, maybe the uh, reservoir. The most recent report is by uh, Dr. Guan Yi's group from Hong Kong. Uh, I think that was a really nice article because she, because he, uh, his group identified the uh, pangolin coronavirus were showing high homology to the SARS-CoV-2. Now that also has a uh, question. Those samples actually was uh, obtained in the anti-smuggling operation from 2017 to 2018, right? So there's no animal sample collected during this pandemic, either in Guangdong or even in Wuhan, and no result proving that uh, currently any sick pangolin carrying the virus. Now, that's really weird. Because if we look at back into SARS, right, when, when we identify civets, the palm civet as an interme intermediate animal host, uh, in, uh, during that time, you identify several strains of that uh, virus in, in civets. civets. There, there are, are strains, strains showing, showing uh, low uh, infectivity, uh, low binding affinity to the receptors, and they are intermediate type and they are high affinity and high infectivity types. So you can see the, probably the virus mutated in the animal too, right? Gradually reach a higher infectivity. But for this SARS-CoV-2, we never see any real animal testing sample results from Guangdong, from, from, from any part of the China to identify any animals during the last three, four months that have been testing positive uh, as for SARS-CoV. Only when we see a report from the Sudanese group, we suddenly see, oh, cats can carry the virus. So this is really real. And also it's malfeasance, at least a, a malfeasance, if I'm not mentioning covering up about the investigation on, on animal samples. Um, Dr. Wang, actually, um, I, I, there's another question here from a viewer, uh, Perma Sherpa, and I'm just thinking back to the fact that I happen to know that you are from uh, rural China yourself originally, um, and the question is actually about the wet markets. Um, the question is, if the virus is of natural origin, then why are the wild animals back in the markets? Should, they, should we not be banning those markets uh, with thousands of people dying because of it? Um, and uh, what about uh, the local residents claiming that they have been eating bats and wildlife for decades, but nothing's happened before? Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Dr. Wang? Well, um, in China, you have laws and uh, you have ways to get around laws. So the law that uh, the, uh, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, put in place, they may seem to be uh, very reasonable and uh, they're good, but uh, the CCP officials themselves would uh, try to find ways to get around the laws and they still do whatever they want. So basically, it's a, uh, it's a lawless country and uh, the, the, this, what, whatever the CCP wants to do and they can do it. So. In terms of uh, eating white animals, and uh, and I don't understand why they do it. People are different, and apparently there uh, there are huge profits to be made. Um, so and uh, some CCP um, officials um, benefited from the market financially. So um, I, I would assume that. But uh, if it's a democratic country, then uh, people can ask these questions and uh, make uh, the officials accountable for, uh, for whatever is happening. Um, but in China, you, you, you can only praise the CCP and uh, you, you cannot disagree with them. So 
I mean, I grew up in China. I knew the system, and uh, people um, people is try is just try very hard to not to cross the red line um, that the CCP put in front of them, and uh, the red line is everywhere. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, Dr. Li Wenliang's case, I, I, I assume all the audience would have heard about uh, his case. He's just an ordinary um, uh, person, and he's got a, a doctor degree and working in a prestigious hospital. He's just trying to um, to uh, to live his life and be a, a middle class uh, citizen of China, when he told his colleagues uh, that there was this uh, disease happening, and of course he would uh, he he will have to um, warn his his friends and colleagues about this. Be careful, and even this uh, it's a red line for the CCP, and he it will happen to him. You all know he actually died. Uh, eventually, it was a tra it's a tragedy, but uh, that's how um, people live their lives in China. So this is a bit of a segue into uh, you know let's let's talk a little bit about red lines. We have a question from Mark Wiseman. Um, once the CCP realized, and this will be, I think this Josh will be the right person for this one. Um, once the CCP re realized that it had bungled the containment of the epidemic and the extent of the economic damage that would occur, is it possible that the CCP used, uh, used WHO to spread the contagion worldwide with the hopes of leveling the international economic playing field? Now, this is something that, uh, you know, we've explored a little bit on American thought leaders. Josh, why don't you give us your take here? Yeah, so actually there's a great timeline that was put together by the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which shows that the, the lies the Chinese Communist Party was telling, based on dates, how these lies were repeated by Tedros at the WHO by date, and what the truth of the situation was at those exact same times, and shows that the Chinese Communist Party was lying to the world, lying to the world on many different fronts, lying to the world about inter lying to the world about um, how you know how how contagious this virus was? Whether it can transmit from you know human to human? Uh, it's coming out now that Taiwan may have alerted the, the alerted the WHO in December that there was human to human transmission. WHO denied it, and then Taiwan made the letter public that they had sent to them, showing that people had to be isolated, and by that suggesting that they, the virus was contagious. WHO seemed to ignore a lot of warnings. They seemed to ignore information showing that, uh, again, what the Chinese Communist Party was telling them wasn't accurate. But instead of looking into it independently, instead of investigating it, instead of you know calling the Chinese Communist Party's narratives into question, yeah, they lied to the world at every single turn. And when China closed down, you know, closed down Wuhan, when China started closing things down, and they still had flights leaving the country. Of course, had the WHO acted and warned that this was, you know, a risk of a pandemic and there were problems of this virus spreading, had they been forthright, had they been honest, maybe a lot of countries wouldn't be in the situation they're in now. Josh, a quick follow-up question from Darlene Silver, because this is exactly related to what you were just saying. Is it true that 5 million Chinese flew out of Wuhan the day before they locked down? Is it also true that these people flew all over the world as potential carriers? Uh, yes, that was accurate. That's what was reported, actually. And, um, yeah, of course, you could find public information on this. There were even some different research institutes that traced uh, you know, a few thousand of the individuals who did leave at that time. The outbreak took place right before the Chinese New Year. And you have about 3 billion travel arrangements in China during that time. It was the worst possible time, and notably in the worst possible place, which is Wuhan, which is basically the transit hub of all of China. And so, yes, a lot of people left the city. It, again, happened right before the Chinese New Year, when people are traveling, going home, visiting friends and family abroad. And yes, that very likely contributed to the, the spread of this virus. And that's one of the reasons why the Chinese Communist Party's censorship of it and you know, even arresting individuals who tried warning the world about it is being taken so serious because they're lying to the world about it, let people leave the country and let them travel to all parts of the world and very likely could have contributed to this becoming a pandemic instead of a localized virus. 
Um, I've got a question related uh, to uh, Dr. Lin. Uh, it's from 3Squad56. <laughs> Um, and this is regarding patient zero. We've heard there's been a lot of you know speculation about uh, patient zero. Our documentary goes into this a bit. What do we know so far at present about patient zero? Based on uh, reports by Chinese uh, medical doctors and scientists, uh, now they kind of kind of officially saying that the patient zero will be some. Uh, one person uh, got infected in December 1st. Um, but however, there are other studies saying that uh, maybe uh, other people got infected in the middle of uh, November uh, in, in Wuhan area. So it's still an ongoing investigation. There is no conclusive, um, uh, con uh, really strong evidence, conclusive evidence to prove uh, someone is uh, patient zero because it's even hard to check on which um, animal will be the intermediate host because if it's happened naturally, you was if you can identify the patient zero, you usually can identify how did he get infected. So you could identify what kind of animal maybe this person you know get uh, interaction and got infected, right? So uh, it's all these part is still mysterious in in China. So I think this is a, a biggest question. Even though the Chinese government tried to blame uh, you know the patient zero could be come from other countries. Uh, but I don't think uh, any of the uh, phylogenetic analysis so far can uh, prove that. And even though there are uh, recent studies showing that the coronavirus have different, potentially different type based on uh, gen genetic code um, analysis, but all these type A, B, C that are being reported, uh, uh, they all have uh, cases from Wuhan uh, showing more ancestral uh, sequences. So I think the patient zero is still in China, but we just don't know who, who is the patient zero right now. And a follow-up question to Josh. This is actually kind of the second part of this question. Um, who, uh, patient zero, could they have been a researcher who was cremated? And I'm wondering if there's any further info on this. So in our documentary, we tell the story of this intern who was working at this Wuhan laboratory who a lot of people believe may have been the real patient zero. And we note how her information was scrubbed from the website of that laboratory, Not notably scrubbed very hastily, it seems, and done very sloppily because they left some information of her on the website, even though they not denied she was ever there. there now, the, uh, some of the different news articles coming out actually corroborate our findings on that. Robert her claims on that. And of course, we can't take exclusive um, credit for that because her story was spreading around even before. You know, it was, in, it was in the public domain. But it does seem, at least in my analysis, that her her story is a very plausible one. She may have been the real patient zero. And the story generally goes like this, that she was one of the researchers there. There were reports coming out that there were some accidents in the handling of bats. And there was cross-infection to a human. This intern, in, in particular, got out passed it to her boyfriend, began spreading it around Wuhan unknowingly. And so, yes, we, we do tell her story in the documentary. So let's jump to a bit of a different vantage point. And I think we'll have to talk to uh, Dr. Wang about this because this is kind of his, his special specialization. Um, the question is, the whole world is putting huge hope on vaccine development. Uh, and uh, that the population could get uh, vaccination, inoculated, and develop herd immunity. What is your view on the progress of vaccine development as we stand right now? Well, let me answer this question first. And I, I have some um, um, things to say about uh, the, the patient zero as well, if I may. Um, in, in terms of vaccine development, uh, vaccines, by definition, uh, are going to be given to healthy individuals. So uh, you want to you want to protect people. You don't want to poison people. So the first and, and the most important uh, uh, thing for vaccine development would be safety. So you want to uh, vaccinate uh, a large part of the population with your vaccine. 
And uh, the, the last thing you want is uh, it's actually causing a disease to uh, the people vaccinated. So safety is number one, and then uh, efficacy. So the, the vaccine has to uh, do the job. So um, uh, stimulating a immune response from uh, from people and. Uh, and when, when they're infected by the, the virus, uh, the, the, your immune system is ready. So um, you cannot escape this two thing uh, at all uh, when you develop uh, your vaccine. So it takes time. Um, you uh, we will be we'll, we will be extremely lucky if we have. Uh, uh, a vaccine by the time uh, this time next year. Um, I, you know, from my experience, uh, that that that's how long it would take um, to make sure it's safe and uh, and it's working. Uh, of course, you know, technology develop um, to be better, and uh, you can speed up things. And uh, so, I I mean, it's it's just uh, certain steps you cannot skip. Um, so um, there, I, I, I'm glad to see there are a lot of people uh, putting a lot of effort in developing uh, different kinds of uh, vaccines uh, against uh, this virus. Uh, I hope um, I'm, I'm a confident. I'm confident that uh, uh, sometime next year we will we'll see effective vaccines in. Um, in the market, um, and, and going back to the patient zero thing, uh, it's it's about the uh, transparency and uh, and basically when we deal with uh, this virus, it's it's a common an enemy of all human beings, and uh, we should all put our um, efforts together to fight this. Uh, so. It, it requires uh, the entire com scientific community, it doesn't matter you're in China or in, in the US, to put your mind and effort together, and share uh, the knowledge and share the information in a 100% transparency um, fashion uh, in order to fight this and, um, and defeat this quickly. What we see in China is that uh, right after uh, the lockdown Wuhan and other places in China, they basically uh, um, blocked all the information. In the earlier days, uh, Chinese scientists actually were able to um, submit papers to international journals. Um, but later on, they basically blocked every, everybody, and they have to go through certain censorship uh, to be able to submit their information, which uh, which tells me there's something they have to to hide, and uh, and that's exactly um, why it's important for the international scientific community to um, to really uh, practice. Um, academic freedom and uh, we we just have to dig deeper to find the truth um, but what I what I found troubling was that uh, actually the scientific community was trying to be uh, politically correct and uh, you know nature has um, published apologies and uh, and so on and so forth I I, I get it so uh, People, um, um, some people um, actually discriminate against uh, Chinese because uh, you know the, uh, the the viruses come from China, and then we'll, we'll always see people like that. But that shouldn't prevent us from asking the questions and dig deeper to find the truth. I found the uh, the the, the um, international scientific community's attitude in this. Uh, sacrifice academic freedom for political correctness is very troubling. I've got a question I'm going to lob over to Dr. Lin here. Um, essentially, you know, Josh, you talked about how bizarre it is that this lab and this researcher isn't kind of front and center of, of the whole discussion, uh, if, if, even for pot potential propaganda uh, purposes. So we have here a coronavirus CV is asking, 
uh, what factors or conditions would need to have been present to result in a virus escaping from the Wuhan P P4 lab? What are the protocols? Has anybody alerted or was it covered up? So I think uh, one important issue you need to point out that uh, for study of the coronavirus, even for gain of function study, you only need a P3 facility. You don't even have to go to P4 facility. So uh, for leaking this virus, there, there could be many situations. I remember when I uh, was working on HIV, uh, it was a P3 facility. There's one time actually um, we were using a centrifuge you know, to spin the virus uh, through the tubes to pellet in the virus. Uh, somehow, one day, one tube got cracked inside the centrifuge, right? So fortunately, we see a little bit liquid come out of the centrifuge cover, so we didn't even open it. But it was like, this is a, a simple example. Uh, some uh, even just simple failure of a tube can cause a leakage, right? And maybe the, if, if you're a technician, you didn't pay uh, attention enough, you may get you know, in fact, you be contaminated yourself. So there are other potential uh, management issues in, in this kind of lab, especially when you're doing with animal studies. So I mean, how do you handle the animal uh, corpse and the environment, uh, whether the technicians handling the animals following the proper procedures, uh, precaution measures, right? So the technician may get infected, the animal corpse, if it's not treated, handled it pro properly, maybe even sold to the uh, you know, web market. These are the potential sources that you can spread the virus to the community as well. And so uh, it's lab management issues, but, but it, that's why it's always uh, high risk to study these highly, pathi uh, highly pathogenic pathogens. Uh, it's really uh, need a strict uh, management for these handling of the virus uh, for these highly pathogenic pathogens. And I also want to add a sentence regarding the vaccine development. So I saw uh, Dr. Wan mentioned about the vaccine development. Uh, I wasn't too optimistic, you know, because uh, the world being, for example, even in our uh, Watery Institute of uh, Research, uh, the military been studying about dengue uh, vaccine for the last two, three decades, uh, but no vaccine so far. Uh, HIV has been known for such a long time, we only have cocktail therapy, we don't have effective vaccines too. And SARS outbreak, you know, in 2003, but so far we still don't have SARS vaccines. So even though for the last 10 years, uh, there are so many different new platforms being developed for uh, design developing vaccine. But I think one fundamental issue is uh, we still know very little bit about the immunologies, how virus evade uh, immunities even causing cytokines or whether they are um, antibody dependent enhancement of the virus uh, infections. Because there are so many questions in related to immunology still not answered. So I actually wasn't too optimistic about the vaccine development. People can hope for it. And in, uh, in initial results, in the phase one result, we, we will see in, probably in a couple of months, we will see some initial results. But whether long term it will be a very effective vaccine or not, uh, it's still a big issue. A question for Josh. Um, there's been uh, basically criticism uh, about around the documentary that it's kind of promoting the engineered origin uh, theory. And I'm wondering if you could actually speak to that. Yeah. So in the documentary, we, of course, look into this laboratory. We, of course, do look into evidence that maybe it was engineered because they were making uh, chimeric viruses. They were creating new viruses at that laboratory. And they were working on altering natural viruses at that laboratory. All of that work was, in fact, being done at that laboratory. To write that off would not be responsible journalism. That is not to say, though, that we say that is the absolute case. But we do feel it necessary at a time when there is not a clear conclusion, at a time when we don't have answers, to at the very least show what was being done at that lab, the kinds of viruses that were present at that lab, and to show what may have happened, you know, we, we of course need to acknowledge this. Now that said, uh, it does, you know, of course they also had natural viruses there. They also had uh, bat coronaviruses, notably the doctor she had written about, that could allegedly jump from a uh, bat to a human without needing an intermediary species. And so it's also very possible it came uh, from one of those bat viruses. We again, we don't jump to conclusions. The documentary is not meant 
to jump to a conclusion on that. We do show evidence on both sides because that is responsible journalism, at least as far as I'm concerned. So, Josh, you're, you don't believe the documentary is making firm, firm conclusions. Um, what, do you, what other work do you hope that this documentary will spur? Well, you know, part of the idea of this documentary, um, I, I understand, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I heard there were audio issues with me, so maybe I'll say it again. You know, the idea of this documentary was not to come to a hard conclusion, because the fact is we don't have that. We don't have those answers right now. Until there's a real investigation, until we can get investigators on the ground in China into these labs, possibly, which does appear to be the general consensus now when it comes to international investigations on the origin, until we get those answers, we're not going to have a 100% answer. And so the idea with this documentary was just to look into what we can show, what evidence is there, what are the different you know, trails of information we can follow that would lead us to having a better understanding of where this thing came from. Of course, we look into every claim. We look into the idea that maybe it came from this Wuhan seafood market. Uh, the evidence we show uh, pretty much discredits that. And of course, that has been largely discredited already. We look into the idea that maybe it came from this P4 laboratory. And uh, based on what we've seen, that may very well be the case. And based on information that has come out after we published this from other media that does corroborate our findings, uh, that may very well be the case. Uh, we also look into the idea of possible bioengineering. Uh, we show evidence of the research that they were doing around this, that they were writing about it publicly. They had reports on it. Uh, we also show the possibility of a bioweapon. Doesn't mean that we conclude that that is the case. It's just we, being responsible, are looking into the different claims, the different possibilities, and showing evidence that could support those or disprove those. My personal analysis, based on you know having done this documentary and looking into it, I personally think it was a natural virus. That's my personal conclusion. And uh, the, if the documentary, I know we did have individuals who, you know, did say, may, you know, they think it may be bioengineered. That's their opinion, of course. But as a responsible journalist, I'm not going to silence other people just because my conclusion is different from theirs. So this is actually something I may ask more than one of the panelists, but I want to start with uh, Dr. Wong. Um, and it's just kind of talking about the general reality in China. We've discussed that a little bit and how that actually pertains to the statistics we get from there. I've been very disturbed by the fact that a number of Western media carry the Chinese statistics as if they're fact um, uh, and so forth. And this is actually, this is a question from Shailendra Ahur. Um, how can the world n know the exact numbers of COVID-19 infection and deaths from China? Because the world total numbers are super high compared to the epicenter, China. What do you make of this, Dr. Wang? Well, um, this uh, virus come from China, and uh, the Chinese Communist Party is the governing body, um, and the, uh, they're responsible for this. Uh, and there's no other way to to look at it. And uh, the the Chinese, the CCP, has a history of um, of uh, censoring information, manipulating information. Um, the basically their number one priority is uh, their uh, power, and uh, whatever they feel that uh, it's uh, it's threatening to their power, they will do whatever to. Um, manipulate it, and they see this, uh, this pandemic um, as uh, as something they have to control the information, and uh, and now you see that it's it's almost it's it's almost amusing. I I am using the wrong word to say it because um, because uh, the world has suffered so much. And uh, we still see the number in China being like a few thousand deaths. This is just impossible. And uh, they see this uh, as uh, something like uh, it's obvious, and their cover up has uh, basically backfired. So they 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 jumped their number today um, by fifty percent of of the death in Wuhan. And we just uh, they they have no respect for facts. Everything is up for manipulation, 
And whoever in the West would believe in the numbers that released by the CCP would be a fool. Stupid. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Um, let's talk a little bit about the realities of these patients, about the cost. This, I'm going to lob this to Dr. Lin. Um, from what we know now, will there be any long-term effects for the patients who are actually recovering from coronavirus? Oh, there are multi faces uh, regarding this long-term effect. It uh, depends on how uh, severe people's symptoms are developed when they got infected, right? Because many people, if they're having a severe disease, they may actually uh, have damage to the lungs or multiple organs, right? If they may come come back from multiple organ failures, and so they will suffer for a long time for uh, this, especially lung damage. Many people may live on, you know, respirators for a long time. And also, uh, if it's milder disease, people will still uh, need support for oxygens. And also, um, even if you just have a uh, very mild infection, it could become uh, uh, embedded in your, in your systems. Uh, overall, if we talk about whole population, it may be an endemic situation, right? So be, it, it may become seasonal, uh, but... Uh, it's hard to predict right now because it's a virus. Quite often, I, I feel, you know, if you're in virology for a long time, I just feel a lot of time virus outsmart human beings. So this one is particular uh, smart and it, you know, how to evade system. It probably replicate uh, in different efficiency in different human organs too. And so how do you handle uh, this kind of outbreak with one simple vaccine? Uh, it, it's a big issue. So even people recover from it, these uh, virus titles may research maybe in a couple of months when the virus continue to mutate in your body uh, in low titers. So one day maybe they have a breakthrough in certain organs as well. So it, it's hard to, hard to predict right now because I think so far we know very little bit about virus kinetics overall in, in different organs, in different, uh, in different uh, part of the human bodies. This part of the study is still missing a lot. And also regarding about the immune response, how the virus evade immune response, and also how the virus uh, titers and the kinetic was so high even the, before the paper showing symptoms. These all are mysterious questions. So you also have consequence for people who even showing like recovered, even you know they come out of the hospitals, but people don't know when this virus may research and they may already suffer uh, from different, uh, different organ damage and they may be become immune compromised as well. So I think there a lot of consequences we still need an investigation. Okay, so we're actually nearing the end of our program here. I'm going to give everyone a chance to kind of sum up uh, one minute time and let's start with Dr. Wang. Thank you, Yang. I, um, I'm really concerned about uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that the WHO is actually uh, towing the CCP line. And I'm also very concerned about uh, the, the scientists, with, uh, the doctors within the WHO organization. And, uh, and actually in the West in general, um, we we um, we're scientists, and we uh, respect the facts uh, more than anything else. So if uh, if we start to um, to sacrifice academic freedom um, because of whatever pressure from from the CCP or the WHO, um, that's going to bring tragedy like this one to human race. I'm really concerned about this, and I hope people will pay special attention to academic freedom from now. Um, Dr. Lin, your one minute. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to say uh, con congratulations to Josh and his team for the successful producement, uh, production for this uh, documentary. And I think this documentary actually at least uh, brought up people's uh, concern about the origin of the virus. 
And I think, I hope actually it can trigger investigation into Wuhan Institute of Virology, especially on the gain of function studies. I'm not necessarily saying this lab produced the SARS CoV 2, but their, uh, product, uh, their uh, intense study on the coronavirus with gain of function uh, features definitely need to be investigated. To me, this is ignoring uh, biomedical ethics in the pursuit of scientific achievement. And it's just like another example, you know, making um, human clones. So I think these part, even this aspect, definitely need a word attention, need a thorough investigation. And Josh, of course, you're the closer. Yeah. So you know, when it came, when it comes to this documentary, and I, I think maybe what I hope it could achieve, you know, what I what, you know, not just me. We had a good team on it, but you know, what we were trying to really achieve was to just give people a package of information that will help them see through all this noise going around around this virus. We of course, you know, we, we try to show evidence on every main track and to show what would, you know, if we can disprove it, we disproved it. If we had evidence for it, we showed it. And I, I think that that is, you know, of course it's not conclusive, it's not absolute, and it doesn't show every single track that there is out there when it comes to everything we can find on the virus altogether. But when it comes to the origin of it, I think we have pretty much all the bases covered. And the articles now coming out and the different mainstream news outlets uh, really do seem to be corroborating our findings. And so my hope is that people will be able to get a better idea of what we're dealing with, the kind of threat the world is facing right now. And hopefully, you know, this documentary and the evidence we found and presented will help in the investigations into it, the further investigations into it. Well, I, I'm, you know, I certainly hope so as well. Um, before we finish up here, I just want to encourage everyone that's watching. Um, this is going out via numerous live streams. If you're watching this via the Epic Times front page and so forth, please be sure to basically log in to sign up for membership. We also have the Epic Times app. It's actually one of the top apps in the uh, Apple App Store, at least from what I'm aware right now. It's a very, very popular way to read the Epic Times. Um, at the same time, uh, we're going out via YouTube, of course, via American Thought Leaders. If you haven't subscribed, please, you know, like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, NTD, you could look that up, the Epic Times Crossroads. Uh, Joshua Philip has his own channel, extremely popular. He's talking about everything to do with coronavirus five nights a week. Uh, and, and it's actually, you know, very, very compelling stuff. Um, and... Uh, as well on Facebook, if you have, if you're watching via Facebook, I encourage you to um, basically like the channel, uh, subscribe, and uh, we are going to uh, be looking forward to seeing more of you. We're going to be doing more of these <laughs> live streams in the future, and. Uh, uh, it's actually um, a topic that we're going to be covering extensively. One more mention about the Epic Times front page. That's theepochtimes.com. If you're not familiar with it, theepochtimes.com. Right on the front page, there's a link to a giant another front page, which is all the most recent coronavirus info, including a lot of exclusive information from China. And on another track, um, there's a new channel that's grown almost exponentially called NTD China in Focus, which also five nights a week, it might even be more at this point, is delivering uh, the top, top information uh, uh, basically uh, via uh, a video. And it's, uh, again, it's, it's grown 250,000 subscribers or more in, in just over two months from what I understand. So, Please join us, please stick with us, and we'll alert you to more of these types of live streams as they come.